holy. Then you go back to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And then verses 23 and 24, and hath put all things, I'm sorry, uh, verse, I need to switch back to chapter 4 of Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 23 and 24. And be ye renewed in the spirit of your mind that ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And then one more quickly in the New Testament in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And verse 1, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. God's a holy God, but he also demands that of us. The word that's used there for most of these, at least in the Old Testament, is, is the word kadash or kadash, and it's the holiness, and the best definition of that is found in Habakkuk 1.13, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil. The purity, the cleanness of God is what he sees when he looks at the throne room of God. And so you have the holiness of God being proclaimed, but we see that holiness. Now you have holy, holy, holy. Why three of them? Well, most of us at one time or another that are priests to preach, oh, that's the Trinity. And it may be. But you see other things in the Old Testament, especially where you see things in threes. Jeremiah 7, 4. Jeremiah 22, 9, 29. And Ezekiel 21, 27. It's not the word holy there, but you see this, this, and this. Threes repeated for emphasis sake. And I think more than anything else, we need to emphasize the holiness of God. I've sat in, in, um, ordina on ordination councils and heard that fateful question, which of the attributes of God is the most important? You know, and, and people, pastors will sit around and argue that point. Uh, if there is one, I think it's holiness. It's who he is. It describes who he is. But it also describes where we need to be. We need to come to the holiness of God. The doorposts moved. It says the, the, the doorposts in verse 4. Get back to Isaiah chapter 6. It says, And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. The doorposts, the thresholds moving at that voice. All we can really gain from this is that that whole sound of the seraphims bouncing that phrase, holy, 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 was such a, an awesome sound and a tremor and a concussion was heard as can happen with noise. But then it says that that's filled the temple, but also then the smoke filled the temple. Back just a couple of chapters in Isaiah chapter 4 and verse 5. And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and a shining of the flaming fire by night for upon all glory shall be a defense. That cloud, that smoke that filled the temple. You also have it referred to when Solomon dedicated the temple. You saw it in the wilderness as, as God led the children of Israel. It was a visible presence or a visible sign of the presence of God. So what was this temple filled with? As Isaiah looked at this throne room as it were and he looks at this, what is he seeing that it's filled with? The first thing is it says the train filled the temple. The temple is filled with the presence of God. The temple is filled with the glory of God. In verse 3 it says the whole earth is full of his glory. Not just the temple, but the glory of God fills. And then you have the sound of praise filled the temple. And then you have the smoke being said to fill the temple. That, that sign of the visible presence of God. And as we close, just to draw your attention from that to what we find in 1 Corinthians, where it's declared twice that we are the temple of God. 
And I challenge you with this, that as that temple of God was filled with the presence of God and the glory of God and the sound of praise, so should our lives. That's how these truths of who God is should impact us. This is a passage that I've gone back to over and over again because I need to see God as He truly is. Because when you see God as He truly is, you will see yourself as Isaiah did later in this chapter, you will see yourself as you truly are. Because the contrast in this one chapter, and I, I have another page, and I, I left it back in Tuella this morning. I forgot to bring it, but I had another page of the contrast that you see in this chapter. And you'll have to study this out uh, for yourself. But one place, in verse 5, he says, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips. Guess where that word dwell is found elsewhere? Back in verse 1, where it says the Lord is sitting. It's the same word used there. He's saying, God, you're there in your holiness, and I see you in that holiness, and then I see where I'm dwelling. You're dwelling there, I'm dwelling down here. The contrast that you see between God and mankind, they're all the way through here. And the other thing that you see is Isaiah's response. We don't have time to get into that. But you heard it from the choir. Do we really see God as He is? He's a sovereign God. He's a seated God. He's not going anywhere. His eternality is seen there because he's the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity. And then as the people of God, what's our response when we see him? It should be the same as what he saw with that temple. Our lives should just be filled so that others can see it with the presence of God and the praise of God and the glory of God. Let's see God for who he is. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, help us to understand you as best we can with our minds. Lord, help us to see you as, we clear, as clearly as we can as we look into the pages of your word. Lord, change us by using the truths of who you are. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.